46 states are joining the territory of Guam and the District of Columbia to sue Facebook for antitrust violations, and they're asking the court to break up Facebook from Instagram and WhatsApp. Based on the sheer number of attorneys general involved in this case, it looks like it's not politically motivated. What are they claiming and what do they have to prove in order to win? All of that coming up on Legal Bites. Hey everyone, welcome to Legal Bites. I'm Alita, I'm a lawyer, and on this channel we explain the law one bite at a time. So today we're looking at the complaint that was filed on December 11th to open up an antitrust lawsuit by a bunch of attorneys general against Facebook. Now there are actually two lawsuits that were filed against Facebook alleging antitrust violations. The other one was filed on the same day as this one, but it was filed by the Federal Trade Commission, or the FTC. It makes a lot of similar allegations and it asks for similar relief. I'm not really going to dig into the FTC lawsuit, but I do want to note that the FTC did review and essentially approve the transactions for Facebook to buy Instagram and WhatsApp before Facebook actually bought them. So for their lawsuit, the FTC will probably be required to give an explanation as to why they're suddenly essentially revoking their approval. In the relatively near future, I would expect the FTC to come out with some kind of evidence showing that somehow the FTC didn't have all of the relevant information they needed to properly give that approval, and that if they had had that information, then they wouldn't have approved it. Otherwise, if nothing's changed, then I don't really know why the FTC is bringing a lawsuit when they were the ones who actually essentially approved the deal. You can hate big tech, but let's just say that businesses, even really big ones, should be able to rely on the approval that they get from the FTC for mergers if everything is done properly. But anyway, that's all I'm gonna say about the FTC lawsuit in this video. This video is focusing on the complaint filed in the case brought by the 46 states plus Guam plus DC. Collectively, we'll call these plaintiffs the states. And before we get into the details of the state's lawsuit, I wanted to give a shout out to Roy Munin on Twitter. I really hope that I pronounced your name correctly there. We were looking at doing a video on this case, but he gave us a good nudge to keep looking at it, and he pointed out some interesting things about the complaint, which we'll look at in this video as well. Okay, so to try to keep all of this organized, here's how we'll go about it. First, we'll go over the basic allegations of the lawsuit. Then we'll get into what the states need to prove in order to win. And finally, I'll give a conclusion. Timestamps are in the description below in case you want to skip ahead. And otherwise, as is often the case with antitrust lawsuits, this is a bit complex. So I'll try to keep it as succinct as possible while still giving as complete a picture as I can. And a quick disclaimer, if you're looking for someone to tell you what is going to happen in this lawsuit, no lawyer worth his or her salt will be able to tell you that. Because like any lawsuit, it depends on the evidence that comes out in the litigation, and it depends on how the judge or jury evaluates that evidence as it's presented by both sides. The purpose of this video is to try to go through the basics of the lawsuit so you can understand it as it develops over time. Obviously, this has the potential to impact millions or maybe billions of people, so it's good to be able to understand the case as it develops. And also, lawsuits generally take a long time, and antitrust lawsuits in particular can take even longer than the average lawsuit. So if you're hoping that there will be a fast resolution, I'm sorry to say this, but you're probably going to need to sit with some patience. Okay. Let's dive in. So the states basically say this. First, Facebook has been in a competitive decline in recent years. Whereas during their growth phase to become a tech giant, they responded to competition by giving consumers what they wanted in a better way. Now they're instead engaging in anti-competitive behavior by simply buying up other startups that either pose a threat by becoming competitors themselves or pose a threat by getting into the hands of Facebook's competitors. According to the states, sometimes this involved folding the acquired company's services into Facebook services. But other times, according to the complaint, Facebook would just terminate the service immediately after the transaction since really all they allegedly wanted was to prevent the company from aiding Facebook's competition. And according to the states, when Facebook makes an offer to one of these startups that gets rejected, or when Facebook otherwise decides not to pursue the startup, they allegedly engage in tactics seeking instead to bury the startup. For example, the states say that in those cases, Facebook would turn to what they call an arsenal of exclusionary tactics to foreclose them from accessing resources that they had come to rely upon. Specifically, they highlight two apps as big examples of companies that Facebook bought only to be anti-competitive. 
Instagram, and WhatsApp. Secondly, at the same time, the states say that Facebook has become increasingly exclusionary by restricting access to its application programming interfaces or APIs. Now, I know that I have viewers that are way more knowledgeable in tech than I am, so I'll try to keep this definition general so that I don't misstate this. But if I do, as always, let me know in the comments. I'm always happy to continue learning here as well. But basically, here's my understanding of APIs. An API is a computing interface that allows one piece of software to interact with another. A tech company can allow access to its APIs in order to give other businesses the opportunity to create something else that essentially builds on the tech company's goods or services. For example, Apple opens its APIs to iOS, so third-party app companies can create apps for iPhone users to customize their phones. Any app that you download through the iOS app store that's made by a third-party company has built off of iOS's APIs. Is that right? Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. Anyway, initially, Facebook apparently gave open access to its APIs to third-party apps that, according to the complaint, really benefited everyone in this whole ecosystem. It benefited the third parties because they had seamless access to users on the Facebook platform. And it benefited Facebook because this arrangement brought more traffic to Facebook from external websites, and the openness of the platform really brought a lot of goodwill to it. And they say the users benefited because they had a better overall user experience. However, according to the complaint, over time, that all changed. In 2013, Facebook apparently changed its platform policy to forbid apps that would essentially replicate Facebook's core functionality. They apparently never gave an explanation as to what that core functionality was, nor did they allegedly explain how those policies would apply when Facebook eventually expanded its functionality to a new area. But basically, the result was that any apps on the platform thinking of adding any features that were social in nature ended up not adding those kinds of features for fear of getting kicked off of Facebook. As a result of all of this, the states say, Facebook's actions have chilled innovation, deterred investment, and forestalled competition in the markets in which it operates. And in the end, it harms users and advertisers. It harms users because of degraded quality of user experience, less choice in personal networks, and reduction in privacy options in both quality and variety. And it harms advertisers because it creates less transparency to assess the value received from ads, and it results in harm to advertisers' brands by pairing it with offensive content. Now they round up these allegations into three counts. Count one is a claim for unlawful monopoly maintenance in a personal social networking services market. Count two is a claim that Facebook's acquisition of Instagram violates section seven of the Clayton Act. And finally, count three is basically the same as count two, except it's for Facebook's acquisition of WhatsApp. If you've been following our channel for a while, you may have seen our videos on the Epic Games lawsuits versus Apple and Google. Those also alleged antitrust violations, but they were primarily under the Sherman Act. So there's a little bit of newness to talk about here with counts two and three. That said, in those videos, we went into some more of the background of where antitrust law came from, and we went into more detail about how the process goes down between the plaintiff and proving the basic elements of the claim and the way in which the defendant has a chance to rebut the claim, even if the plaintiff otherwise proves everything that they need. So if you want more detail on that, it's worth checking out. And then obviously subscribing to the channel because you clearly want to see more of this kind of content out there, right? Okay, so now let's get into what the states need to prove in each of these counts in order to win. So without rehashing the entire history of antitrust law, let me just remind you that antitrust law developed in the late 1800s and early 1900s in order to protect consumers from corporations that had gotten to be too big to fairly negotiate with. If you've heard of the robber barons, the titans of oil, railroads, and other industries, people like the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, etc., Antitrust law was created in order to kind of tilt the scales back so that these enormously wealthy tycoons couldn't just take advantage of the public by just, well, railroading them with their wealth. If they were going to become big enough to corner their respective markets, they had to do it in a way that was fair and still allowed for competition, which ultimately benefited consumers. So now there are two important things I want to point out about antitrust law. First, although cases are often brought by competing businesses, antitrust law is designed to protect consumers. So at the end of the day, in order to win, any plaintiff has to tie their allegations about the wrongful conduct of the defendant to ways in which they've harmed consumers, in this case, Facebook users. And second, antitrust law is not intended to be anti-business. In order to protect consumers, this area of law seeks to protect competition between businesses. Because of that, courts have to strike a very delicate balance between not overcorrecting or undercorrecting a business that might be acting badly. 
If they undercorrect, courts are essentially giving free reign to monopolies to take advantage of the public. And if they overcorrect, the courts run the risk of chilling legitimate growth of business. So courts have to keep that balance in these kinds of cases, which is even harder when you consider how much the businesses involved are worth and the kind of impact that it can have on the economy, etc. So with all of that set aside, there are three main statutes that Congress passed in the late 1800s and the early 1900s in order to create this area of law. The Sherman Act was passed first in 1890. Then in 1914, Congress passed the Federal Trade Commission Act, which created the FTC, and the Clayton Act, which specifically prohibited certain types of monopolistic practices that weren't already covered by the Sherman Act. We won't go into the FTC Act here since it's not really relevant to this particular complaint, although it is very relevant to the complaint that was filed by the FTC, as you can imagine. Count one of the complaint is brought under the Sherman Act, so we'll go over that first before we go over the Clayton Act to explain counts two and three. Now, there are actually several practices that the Sherman Act outlaws, but in this video, we'll just really touch on the one that's mentioned in this lawsuit, and that is unlawful maintenance of a monopoly power. Unlawful monopoly maintenance occurs when a business becomes a monopoly and then engages in anti-competitive behavior in order to maintain that monopoly. To prove it, the states will need to show that Facebook first has monopoly power and second, willfully maintains that power through anti-competitive conduct as opposed to a superior product, business acumen, or historic accident. Now, it's important to note that just being a monopoly is not enough to violate the Sherman Act. The United States Supreme Court has said multiple times that in some instances, it might even be encouraged to have monopolies because it can mean that they have something going on that's doing great with consumers. Either they're providing the best product or they're providing it in a way that consumers want most, or maybe they're just the first to the market with some innovative technology. Either way, a monopoly on its own is definitely not against the law. It's only when they do things to stifle competition to either acquire or maintain that monopoly power that they start facing some kind of liability. For the first element, in order to show that Facebook has monopoly power, the states will specifically need to show that Facebook has market power in the relevant market. I'll get into how to define market power and the relevant market, but first let's go over some light overview here. Another way of thinking of this concept of market power or monopoly power in a relevant market is that states will need to show that Facebook is a really big fish in a really small pond. Now there may be some of you that look at this and say, duh, it's obvious that Facebook is a monopolist here. Are you kidding me? But in any lawsuit, each element still needs to be established by the plaintiff. And sometimes you get some surprising results when you actually go through each element. So as we go into how the states will need to show this, keep that fish pond metaphor in mind because it helps to visualize the concept. Now for the states to win, they're going to want to make the relevant market or the pond look as small as possible so that Facebook looks as big as possible. On the other hand, Facebook will want to make that pond look as big as possible so that they don't look like the monopoly power that the states want to make that to be. And this is likely to be the first place that the two sides really fight in this lawsuit because in a case alleging unlawful maintenance of monopoly power or really in any antitrust lawsuit, to be honest, everything depends on how the relevant market is drawn. And in many cases, that might even be pretty much the entire fight. Like for example, in the Epic Games case against Apple. If you don't know what I mean, check out our video on it. Link is in the description below. So as we go through, you might want to look to see where Facebook might argue that the way that the states are drawing the boundaries of the relevant market is too small. Now, the other part of this is market power. The market power Facebook has in the relevant market also can't just be fleeting either. And I don't think anyone would really argue that Facebook has just a fleeting power in this market. But basically, it needs to be the kind of power where Facebook has the ability to raise prices profitably above those that would be charged in a normal competitive market. Now, because Facebook's monetization strategy isn't direct, meaning because Facebook users don't pay Facebook a fee directly for use of the platform, think of raising prices a little more loosely. Basically, think of it as saying that monopoly power would need to be strong enough so that Facebook could throw pretty much anything at its users and advertisers for that matter that goes against their interests and they would still keep using Facebook. Now, in order to define the relevant market, the plaintiff needs to draw the line around two things. First, the relevant product or service market, and second, the relevant geographic market. 
In this case, the states say that the geographic market is the United States for three reasons. First, they say that there are differences in broadband access in each country. Second, they say social norms also vary in each country. And finally, they say network effects are generally stronger between people within a country. A network effect is basically a phenomenon where increased numbers of people using a good or a service increases the value of the good or service. You'll often find that this is the case with any kind of new tech advancement, particularly in communications. For example, when the fax machine was first invented, it was a cool new thing that could send copies of a document across a far distance almost instantaneously. But when it was first invented, it wasn't instantly valuable because you still needed at least two participants, someone to send a fax and someone to receive one. And then the more people you can send a fax to, the more valuable the fax machine becomes because it has more utility. Social media operates in a similar way. The more people that use Facebook, the more valuable it is. So once a particular platform reaches a certain threshold, you'll see that it's really hard to compete against it if you're another company that hasn't also reached that threshold yet. So the states here say that network effects are stronger within a particular country, and that's one of the reasons why they say it makes sense to draw the relevant geographic market around just the United States. This may be one of the first places that Facebook raises a counter argument to make the pond look bigger. Arguably, one of the benefits of social media platforms like Facebook is they give us the ability to connect with family and friends from all around the world. So Facebook may argue that the geographic boundary made by the states is too small. Personally, I don't really have much of a problem with the geographic boundary drawn by the states here. Intuitively, it kind of makes sense to limit the market to the United States. But what do you guys think? Give us your thoughts in the comments below. Okay, so that's the relevant geographic market. The states also need to draw a line around the relevant product or service market. Going into this part, you can probably guess that the relevant market will have something to do with the social media market. Well, in the complaint, the states define the relevant market as personal social networking services. Because I don't wanna to have to repeat personal social networking services a million times in this video, we'll shorten it to PSNs. So according to the complaint, PSNs consist of online services that enable and are used by people to maintain personal relationships and share experiences with friends, family, and other personal connections in a shared social space. The states give three main criteria for what counts as a PSN. First, they say the PSNs are built on what's called a social graph that maps connections between users and their families, friends, etc. They say that the social graph forms the backbone of all the other features offered by the PSN. Second, they say PSNs have a shared space for users to interact with personal connections, including what they call a one-to-many broadcast format. It's where you post something and a bunch of people can see the post and can interact with it. And finally, they say that PSNs have features that allow users to find and connect with other users to build a network of personal connections. This all makes sense here because it generally does feel like how we define the core type of social media, right? It's a place to socialize in the digital world with shared experiences and interactions, and it's a way to keep in touch with people that you love or people that you love to hate from a distance. Don't tell me you don't hate follow at least one account on social media. And anyway, it gives you a way to reconnect with people by finding them on the platform. Now there are obviously other types of social media platforms and the states try to carve out different types here to make the pond smaller. And the way that courts analyze this is by determining whether the goods or services are reasonably interchangeable with the defendant's goods or services. One way of doing this is by looking at what's called switching costs. Switching costs are costs that a consumer will have to in some sense pay in order to switch from the defendant's product to a competing product. For example, in the Epic Games v. Apple lawsuit, we talked about how iOS users wanting to switch to an Android system would have to change to an entirely different device, namely from an iPhone to an Android phone. And with that, they'd have to buy new hardware, learn new software, and buy all new apps from the start. So in my opinion, I think that's a good example of switching costs. It's the kind of thing that will give a consumer pause before they make the switch to a competing company. The stickier the switching costs, the more likely it is that the two products or services are not reasonably interchangeable with one another. And if they're not reasonably interchangeable, then they don't belong in the relevant market. Now, something that's different in this case from a lot of other antitrust cases is that consumers aren't necessarily mutually exclusive about the social media platforms that they use. 
In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if most people actively used at least two or three different social media platforms on a semi-regular basis. For example, just for Legal Bites, we obviously have a YouTube channel, and then we have a Facebook page and an Instagram account, a Twitter account, and even a Patreon account. I'm also on LinkedIn, and I've been on there ever since law school, so you guys can see that I'm actually a real lawyer. So social media platforms don't compete for exclusivity of consumers in the same way that Apple and Google compete for their iPhone or Android phone consumers. Instead, these platforms compete for our attention, at least a minute at a time. And the complaint doesn't really talk about this at all, which I think is a little bit of an oversight and creates a hole in the way that the states framed this. As I'm sure you know, consumers commonly switch between platforms throughout a single day even, giving minutes of attention at a time to different platforms. And maybe I'm being a little bit optimistic when I say minutes. It might be more like hours watching the insane ways that bakeries can decorate a cookie. Maybe more than I would care to admit. So when I think about switching costs from that perspective, I don't think that they're necessarily particularly high when it comes to most social media platforms. Even still, the states try to carve out different types of platforms to try to make the pond smaller. For the most part, I think it's a little questionable the way that they try to draw some of these lines, but that's just my perspective. As we go through, let me know what you guys think, if you agree or disagree. I'm curious for your thoughts. Okay, so first they say that PSNs that are popular outside the United States, but not inside the United States, should not be counted as PSNs for the purposes of this lawsuit because of those geographic network effects we talked about earlier. So that one, I guess, does make a little bit of sense. Then they say that PSNs do not include specialized social networking services like LinkedIn or Strava. They say that because they share a narrow and highly specialized category of content for a distinct set of purposes, they shouldn't be included. I don't think that I really agree with this one, especially when it comes to LinkedIn. That distinction seems to be a little bit odd because when you look at the three things that the states say characterize a PSN, it hits all three of them. And it seems like enough people are on LinkedIn that you can find most colleagues and former colleagues through the app, if not friends and family. And I don't know about you, but over the past year, I saw a lot of similar postings in my LinkedIn feed as were in my Facebook feed, particularly about political issues. So it doesn't seem to me that it's really that niche. And I think LinkedIn is pretty reasonably interchangeable in a lot of ways because it has the same tools to demand our attention that Facebook has, and the switching costs are just not that high. So that one seems to be stretching it a little bit, in my opinion. Then they say that PSNs do not include platforms that are focused on consumption of video and audio content like YouTube, Spotify, Netflix, and Hulu. Now, I don't think that that distinction makes any sense. The only thing that really links these different platforms is the fact that they play video and audio content. Netflix and Hulu aren't particularly social in nature. They primarily just stream content. Spotify is a little more social, I guess, since you can follow other people's playlists, but there's not much interaction in comments in Spotify, at least not that I've seen anyway. But YouTube, on the other hand, is incredibly social. The way the channels grow on YouTube is by creating communities of people that interact over particular topics of interest. A large number of YouTube viewers don't just passively consume content. There can be some very lively discussions in comment sections. If you don't believe me, check out the comment sections in any of our election law videos or our videos on Dr. Disrespect or the Epic Games antitrust videos. People yell at each other, they yell at me sometimes, it's all great fun. So anyway, I don't think that YouTube should really be excluded from the PSNs because it also seems to pretty much hit all of those three characterizations of a PSN. Anyway, so then they say that PSNs also should not include messaging apps like iMessage and WhatsApp. Now, I actually do agree because messaging apps don't have that shared open forum that characterize a PSN. And that actually introduces a problem for this complaint, which I'll get into in a little bit. Just put a pin in it for a moment. So basically, I don't see a problem with the way that the complaint defines personal social networking services, but I do think it's a little wonky that they try to exclude certain platforms like LinkedIn and YouTube. Now, if I were trying to draw a line around the PSNs, I wouldn't go the route that the states did here by trying to exclude certain types because of the medium of content that they use. And I also wouldn't try to exclude certain platforms based on how they somehow specialize in a certain area of life, like LinkedIn. After all, those distinctions don't really matter when you take a step back and think about the fact that they're all competing for our attention and they all to some extent use mixed forms of media and involve various aspects of our lives. Instead, I would draw the distinction around the type and volume of engagement that users have with one another. In other words, how social is the social media platform? If it has a robust comment section that tends to create communities, I would say that it fits with PSNs. 
but if the platform doesn't really give much room for direct users engagement, it doesn't seem to fit with this definition of a PSN. So that would mean that platforms like YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Reddit, Twitch, and LinkedIn would all be in as PSNs on one end of the spectrum. And platforms like Netflix and Hulu, which have pretty much no social engagement at all, would be on the other. Somewhere in between might be platforms like Pinterest and Spotify because they have some social engagement. But those I would say are far enough from providing a centralized town square-like atmosphere that they wouldn't be part of the relevant market. But let me know if you guys think differently because these are just my thoughts. So anyway, once you've figured out the relevant market, you need to determine if the defendant has market power in that relevant market. If the relevant market is drawn in the way that the complaint wants to draw it, it would seem that the market essentially consists of Facebook, Instagram, which is of course owned by Facebook, Twitter, and maybe Reddit. I might be forgetting some. I don't know what the relative market share of each of these is, to be honest, but for the purposes of just understanding this case, let's just say that if the lines are drawn this way, sure, Facebook is a monopoly. But if you draw it the way that I personally think it should be drawn, I'm not so sure that Facebook is actually a monopoly in this particular case. Which of course is weird because yeah, Facebook is a giant and not everyone likes big tech and Facebook in particular because of some of their practices. And I know that this might be an unpopular opinion. But the way that I'm looking at the market here, I'm not convinced that Facebook is a monopolist, which is a central requirement for the states to win in this lawsuit. If they can't show that Facebook is a monopolist, then they can't win on count one. Feel free to yell at me if you think I'm wrong. I mean, please be nice, but you know what I mean. Okay, but assuming that I'm totally wrong, which is always possible, and assuming that the states do show that Facebook is a monopolist, the next element that they have to show for count one is that Facebook is maintaining monopoly power with anti-competitive activity. In these kinds of cases, courts need to distinguish between aggressive competition and actions that exclude rivals and harm the competitive process. It's not enough for a business to aggressively pursue deals or engage in tough strategies. It needs to be the kind of activity that really has no other benefit to anyone other than to insulate the monopolist from competition. Now, in the complaint, the states allege that Facebook engaged in anti-competitive activity by acting on its buy or bury strategy including Instagram, WhatsApp, and a bunch of other smaller tech companies. So this would seem to encompass not just the purchase of competing companies, but also the way in which Facebook would restrict access to its APIs only to third parties that didn't try to encroach on Facebook's core features. Cutting to the chase here, success of this claim really comes down to whether it ultimately harms or benefits consumers and whether there are any pro-competitive justifications for the act. As a general matter, I wouldn't say that simply the act of buying out a smaller company is anti-competitive in nature. After all, it's one business strategy that isn't exactly uncommon. The people that usher a company through the startup phase don't always necessarily want to continue running that company when it becomes established. Oftentimes, you'll find that startups want to be sold to a bigger company so that they can turn around and start up another business that they can eventually sell as well. So there are benefits to the industry overall in selling startups to bigger tech whales like Facebook and Twitter. So what you really need to do is look at each alleged sale to determine if it was done pro-competitively or anti-competitively. Looking at the purchase of Instagram, for example, I can see some ways in which it benefits Facebook users to have interconnectivity between Instagram and Facebook. For example, Facebook has made sharing between the apps pretty seamless, which does have its benefits if you want to upload a photo or a video onto both platforms. But for WhatsApp, I mentioned a few minutes ago that the state's exclusion of messaging services from their definition of PSNs was potentially problematic. That's because by the state's own definition, WhatsApp is actually not a competitor in the relevant market. So purchasing WhatsApp wouldn't actually be characterized as buying out a potential competitor, which means I don't really see how buying WhatsApp is anti-competitive in nature. And even if WhatsApp is determined to have been a potential competitor for both Instagram and WhatsApp, there could have also been ways that the app's users could have benefited from getting folded into the Facebook universe. For example, by getting access to Facebook's developers or other infrastructure type factors that aren't readily apparent to users because they exist more behind the scenes. Now, it might be a different story for the other startups that Facebook bought and then subsequently destroyed. That seems to be pretty anti-competitive and I can't instantly think of a justification that Facebook might have in doing that other than maybe freeing up those developers so that they could start another business. But there might still be something there. 
It might also be a different story regarding the other third-party apps that Facebook decided to restrict from accessing Facebook's APIs, allegedly in order to prevent the third-party apps from becoming competitors. On the one hand, no company is required to hold itself out there to be slowly fleeced by competition by being forced to do something that's against their interests. So I would think that Facebook should be able to have some measure of control over what kind of access it gives to third-party apps. However, at the same time, the court could determine that this was anti-competitive in nature because Facebook somehow created a situation where other businesses relied on Facebook's APIs in order to exist, and that when Facebook started restricting that access, they were only harming consumers. I don't know how that one will turn out. It'll be interesting to see how the evidence shapes up. Okay, so that's count one. We'll talk about counts two and three together here since they're similar enough to one another. So counts two and three were brought under section seven of the Clayton Act, which is also known as 15 US code section 18. Basically, Section 7 of the Clayton Act says that no company that's big enough to affect commerce can buy out another company if the effect of that purchase is to substantially lessen competition or to tend to create a monopoly. In other words, this is the area of law called mergers and acquisitions. And there are a few different kinds of mergers. There are horizontal mergers, market extension mergers, vertical mergers, and conglomerate mergers. The one that's most likely relevant here is horizontal mergers. Horizontal mergers happen when two or more businesses in the same field or industry combine together. With a horizontal merger, the courts will look to see if the merger creates an undue concentration in the market and they'll analyze how it affects the market overall. Were there anti-competitive results, like did it affect the pricing of the product or service, or did it affect the availability of the products? On the other hand, were there pro-competitive results? Like for example, did it create a space for other entrants to join the market? Or did the merger prevent one of these companies from going out of business? To figure this out, you still have to define the relevant market and the geographic market like in count one. But one thing that the states are going to have to reckon with is the fact that, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, both of these transactions were looked at by the FTC before they went through. And because of that, the court is likely to give some weight to the prior findings of the FTC in their decision not to forbid the transactions. And even though the FTC isn't involved as a party in this lawsuit, the court is still likely to question what, if anything, has changed since the FTC allowed the purchase. If not much has changed, then I don't see how the states are likely to win on counts two and three. But it'll be very interesting to see what evidence comes out during the litigation. Okay, so that was super long, but I hope it was informative for you. And if it was, it would be great if you would hit the like button. It does help us with the YouTube algorithm gods. I know, that's great, right? Another! <laughs> And basically to wrap this up, I don't know how this lawsuit will end up, but I do expect it to take a very long time. And all caveats and disclaimers aside, looking at this complaint, I actually don't really see how this is a very strong case on any of the counts. And part of that is because I disagree with the way that the complaint frames the relevant market here. That said, I could totally be wrong. What do you guys think? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, if you enjoyed this video and you haven't already, consider subscribing to our channel and hitting the notification bell. We upload at least once a week, sometimes more, and we do a lot of deep dives like this one. So if you want to learn about the law or you just want to nerd out about the law, this channel just might be your jam. Anyway, see you in the next video.